everyone uh, to this uh, program. Uh, and I'm going to just mention a little bit uh, about Elaine. I've known Elaine now for 10 years. I met her uh, when she was a docent at the San Diego Museum of Art, and she's still a member of the Museum Asian Arts Council. She enjoys Chinese brush painting. Uh, she uh, uh, developed or uh, learned the love of Asian art from her Chinese mom and uh, spent a summer in Taiwan as a teenager. And uh, she always delivers wonderful lectures. I love to hear her speak. I'm a uh, semi-retired cardiologist from, uh, graduated from Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia. Uh, and I, I am thrilled to be uh, a volunteer at the uh, San Diego Chinese Historical Museum and at the San Diego uh, Museum of Art. And uh, we have as a discussant today, our own Lily Birmingham, who has served as uh, acting uh, director of our of the, our museum and treasurer, curator, docent coordinator, all sorts of jobs, <clears throat> and uh, and we're going to enjoy her uh, discussion after Elaine's talk. Uh, and uh, at this point, I'm going to mention a couple other things about the subtitles. We do have subtitles, and for those of you who uh, want to read the Chinese, uh, my Chinese speaking friends tell me that it's pretty accurate unless a person who is uh, uh, English speaking attempts to say something in Chinese and that befuddles the software. Uh, but beyond that, it's pretty accurate. And uh, the other thing I want to mention is that we'll try to have time at the end for questions. So uh, if you have questions, uh, think of them or write them in the chat box and Elizabeth and Elizabeth Cheney will be keeping track. And after we're all done, you can also raise your electronic hand as well. And we're happy to call on you. So again, I wanna welcome all of our friends to our first lecture of 2024. And lastly, before Elaine starts, I wanna mention the correction that while yes, our, our talks are invariably on the third Saturday with occasional exceptions, February is going to be Sunday the 11th, Sunday the 11th, not uh, Saturday. So it'll be Sunday the 11th. So with that, Elaine, uh, we're looking forward to, to your wonderful talk. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Bob. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I will be mispronouncing all the Chinese words, unfortunately. Uh, at the end, we'll have a list of the artists I'm going to talk about that will be available to you. And Lily Birmingham has kindly put in the Chinese characters of these artists' names, name, so I hope that you will investigate them further. What we'll be talking about is the literati influence on contemporary Chinese art. And I'm using the word contemporary pretty loosely. That means Chinese artists from the 20th or 21st centuries. Uh, next si slide, please. And our questions are today, who were the literati and why was landscape painting such an inspiration to them? I'll mention three important Chinese art theoreticians who have formed the philosophy of Chinese art for centuries and mention these contemporary artists. Next slide. So let's jump to that first question. Who were these literati scholars or Wen Ren? And we see, a an image of them here today. In the center, we see a man doing brush painting and his cultured friends are avidly watching him in the process. In the left lower corner, we see a musician entertaining a literatus. And in the right lower corner, they are admiring antiquities. There are serving servants attending to them and they're in a rural setting. So these were the educated men that in hostile political times often retreated to the countryside and didn't participate in government, which is why we often see them in garden settings like this. And we'll talk more about them through the talk. Next slide, please. And just keep going gradually through these, Elizabeth. The first point I wanna make is uh, we're gonna touch on that nature is sacred. This has been a long-standing belief in Chinese culture, as we'll see. And the second point is that the image is always symbolic. It's not just a mountain. It's not just a tree. There's a deeper meaning in these objects in nature. 
Third, the past is present. As we all know in Chinese culture, there's a great reverence for the past. And there's also a sense of transforming the past to fit the current moment. And finally, art reflects the artists. Just as we might look at someone and evaluate them based on their facial expression or their gait, it was felt that the artist's actual brush strokes told us something about the character and personality of the artist. And we'll see more of that. Next, please. So here are the artists we're gonna talk about. I want to just view this as a brief introduction. So we're going to be going pretty fast. And again, I hope this will just cue you in to want to research them more. And you'll have that handout at the end so you'll be able to look them up because they are all exceptional and distinctive um, artists. For the historical artists, I am not gonna be saying too much. I really want to use them to point us to these contemporary artists. Next, please. So let's start with that first concept, the sacred quality of nature. And I see a question, so I believe I will linger on the slide. You could take a screenshot. I believe it will go into the chat and it could also be emailed out. So we will have ways that we can get that to you. So we'll discuss that at the end. So we think of course of Taoism, 2,500 year old philosophy and religion, and these two opposing qualities of yang, the male, quality and yin, the female quality, and how you can see in the classic symbol, yang is flowing into yin and vice versa, and also yang contains a bit of yin and vice versa. So there's this dynamic balance that is what makes up the universe. And in this painting by Zhao Xiaoyang that Lily will talk more about, we can see a really exaggerated, this is a 20th century painter, and it's an exaggerated depiction of these Taoist opposing forces. So we have these male thrusting mountains going up to the sky, very solid, strong. And then we have water that flows to the lowest point, its form as mist. You'll see that mist is very important in Chinese landscapes. And the void, the void of that valley between the mountains, those are all strong yin factors. Next slide. And as Lao Tzu is supposed to have said, know the masculine, but keep to the feminine. So both these qualities are equally important. And in fact, if we go back as to the earliest written records that we have in Chinese culture, the Shang Dynasty about 3,500 years ago, we see these oracle bones where prayers and predictions of the future are carved into sometimes cow bones or turtle shells. And they have, these characters have been deciphered. And some of them talk about religious ceremonies performed by the emperor himself to worship rivers and mountains uh, to bring good harvests for his people. So you can see how going way back, nature was worshiped as uh, sacred. Next, please. Now, this is a very, very superficial history of Imperial China, and I want to direct your attention that we're going to be focusing on the three dynasties of the Northern Song, 960 to 1279, Yuan Dynasty, 1260 to 1368, and the Ming Dynasty, 1368 to 1644. Next. And that they often reference these two very powerful ancient dynasties, the Han about 2000 years ago and the Tang dynasty 618 to 906. The Han and the Tang were both expansive dynasties. China was powerful, it was expanding its territory. There was lots of trade and cross fertilization of different cultures. So it was a big inspiration to later artists. Next please. And another way we can look at these dynasties is who was in charge. So the Han people are the predominant ethnic group in China today, it's over 90%. Most of the time, the emperor was of Han um, ethnicity. There were two big exceptions, the Yuan and the Qing dynasties. So during the Yuan, it was the Mongols under Kublai Khan that swept down and violently overthrew 
the country. And this created a problem for the literati. When the Han were in charge, they were often part of government, but they were so disgusted by these violent foreign barbarians as they saw them, that, that many of them went to the country and refused to participate in government, even if they had to live in poverty. So that was an essential part of the literati story. Next, please. And I did want to mention these very important theoreticians, Zhe He, who came from a time of great disunity in the country. We'll talk about him in the next slide. Zhao Mengfu during the Yuan Dynasty and Dong Qichang in the Ming Dynasty, and we'll get to them later. So let's talk about Zhe He in the next slide. He is extremely famous for defining the six principles of painting that have been talked about ever since. And they're listed in order of decreasing importance. So let's see what is important for traditional Chinese brush painting. The most important factor has been translated as breath, resonance, life, motion. So notice that it has the word qi in there as in qigong or tai chi. So the animating force, the life within the art, that is far more important than any kind of technical ability. That comes first. Then there's excellence in brushwork, accurate drawing, good use of color and composition, and finally transmission from the old masters by copying. Even though that's last on this list, it doesn't mean it's unimportant. So we have a different attitude in the West that originality is really important. But in China, it was felt that first you needed to copy the masters from the past. And only when you were really good at that then you were capable of becoming a master yourself and imparting your own original touches. Next, please. So our first contemporary artist, Pan Gong Kai, we were so fortunate to have him come to the San Diego Museum of Art and not only curate a show of the museum's collection, but also paint this enormous hand scroll format painting of the noble virtues, the four plants, pine, bamboo, orchid, and plum that represent human virtues. So again, we see this linking of nature and humanity here. He represented China in the Venice Biennale. He's, he's a very uh, well-respected artist. Let's go to the next slide. Out of the catalog for this show, it turns out he's quite a theoretician himself. So in the catalog, he talks about the concept of Li, which means the internal structure, rhythm, and patterns within nature. So unlike this Western preoccupation with surface and outlines, what is its internal nature? Which is why literati artists so enjoy painting things like water and mist, clouds, things that it's not so much the hard edge, but it's this moving force through nature. Pan contrasts Western and Chinese representation saying that in the West, we're interested in fragmented specifics, like an artist might go and copy an exact tree and get that branch structure right. Whereas a literatus would wander through the landscape, knowing it from all different perspectives, taking in the light and the sound of the stream going by, and then go back to the studio and paint from memory the essence of that place. Pan cites the Sung Dynasty poet Su Dong Po, who said, those who paint to resemble the actual subject demonstrate an understanding of art just as much as a child does, which I think is kind of funny because that's not a compliment. And we might say that this is an appreciation of abstraction. I don't think they would think of it in terms of abstraction back then, but again, it's not being slaves to the exact photographic representation of something. It's knowing it from the inside. And finally, one of my points was that art reflects the artist. Pan is saying that here, brushstroke style conveys the character of the artist and was very respected in literati times were the qualities of moderation, openness, magnanimity or generosity, elegance and uprightness. Next slide. So let's look at a segment of Pan's own painting, segment of Noble Virtues. If we had more time, I'd have you put in chat, what do you think about Pan's character from this painting? 
but I have so much material, I'm just going to jump through and tell you that what other people have said about his painting is that he's bold, dramatic, confident, lyrical, not overly obsessed with perfection. So those are qualities that we might assume the artist has that we can read in his brushwork. So that's what people were doing with these uh, literati paintings throughout the centuries. Next, please. And I just want to jump to an entirely different time and place, abstract expressionism, uh, a movement that started in New York in the 1940s and 50s. And you see parallels a lot between abex and literati painting. And in fact, these two artists, Robert Motherwell and Franz Klein, very much studied Chinese calligraphy and were very influenced by it, although they did not like to mention that. So we'll see a few other connections between this movement and Chinese brush painting. Okay, next. So we're gonna start with the Northern Song Dynasty, 960 to 1126. And look at really the most iconic Northern Song painting probably in the world. Next slide. And this is the massive scroll by Fan Quan. It's seven or eight feet tall. And before I forget, I wanna say there's fantastic internet representation of this painting. You can zoom in so close, it's like you're six inches away from it and see the exact brush strokes. There's a video on it. So this is really a good one to research. And you'll notice that there's a very solid, detailed, massive quality to this with very dark passages and light passages. This contrast was very important in the early part of the Northern Song. It reflects the philosophy of the times, Neo-Confucianism. In, and I'll list them here. The investigation of things leads to the perfection of knowledge. This reminds me of the enlightenment in Europe in the 1700s, where you had all these people studying nature intensely, categorizing it, really trying to know it. Uh, so that, that is very much a characteristic of this time period. The unity of man and nature, where nature reflects qualities in humans, and self-cultivation. So the literati developed the three perfections of poetry, calligraphy, and painting, as part of perfecting themselves. That discipline was something that a noble man should try to develop. Next. Now I wanna look to show you a little bit more about the composition of this. If you think about the average scene that you're looking at, foreground, middle ground, background, what looks the biggest? Well, it's the foreground elements that look huge, right? And it gets smaller and smaller as it recedes in space. Look at what the artist has done here. He's reversed that in the painting. The foreground is that little tiny strip at the bottom. The middle ground is a slightly bigger strip and the background is this huge, huge mountain. And he increases the scale of it even more. And I've shown showing you a close up on the left. Can you see those donkeys, heavily laden donkeys? And it's harder to see, but in front and behind the donkeys, there are two men. And where is that in this enormous painting? Now, unfortunately, I don't have my pointer to point it to you, but it's in the lower, yes, yes, very good, thank you. So you see them on the little road there, that little horizontal line is that little line of, of donkeys. And so then the scale of the mountain with that needle-like waterfall on the right side becomes even vaster. And this is a representation of the emperor and the stability of government, the security of the government, which this was the early Northern Song. So this was pretty true at this time before things fell apart. So you can see the symbolism within the landscape. Next, please. And I want to jump right to this contemporary, early contemporary artist, Liu Guosong, who has been called the father of modern Chinese brush painting. You know, Chinese brush painting fell almost into obscurity where the techniques, the art of it might've been lost forever. Because of course the communists thought that the literati were the most useless bourgeois 
horrible people. Why would you ever want to preserve their art or know how to paint like them? And it was really rescued. The art of Chinese brush painting was really rescued by a small number of Chinese artists. And Liu Guo Song was one of them. Now he had an interesting beginning. He was born in Anhui province and like quite a few others in 1949, I believe went to Taiwan. This was a very dangerous time in Taiwan. At least a thousand intellectuals were executed by Chiang Kai-shek and uh, it was under martial law for many years. He was very interested in European art. So he started the fifth moon group of other progressive artists on Taiwan. So they were influenced by artists like Picasso and the abstract expressionists. Well, that was considered very, very dangerous. And they lost their teaching positions. And if he hadn't already been internationally prominent, he probably would have gone to jail. But that's how passionate he was about his art until this turning point when he first got to see this incredible collection of traditional Chinese art at the Palace Museum in 1960. In fact, he was standing in front of the Fan Quan painting that we just saw, and he was transfixed. He spent most of the day going back and forth and studying it. And thereafter, he put away his oil paints and his canvases and returned to using traditional Chinese materials of brush, ink, and paper. But as you can see in startlingly modernist ways, so he's absorbed Western currents of art. He's also uh, the beauty of calligraphy. We can see in this abstraction here, you can see the confidence and speed with which he's moving this big brush. At the top, you see something called flying white, where the hairs of the brush have splayed apart and you see white paper in between the brush strokes. These are things that you need to have a rhythm for. Notice also inside the brush strokes, you see the blue, the dark blue with the black edges. He's loaded the center of the brush with a different color than the outer hairs of the brush. And depending on the pressure that he's um, pressing in on the paper, uh, develops that kind of um, double colored line, which I think is remarkable. So just a master. His work is in 70 museums worldwide in the permanent collection. He is widely renowned. Next slide. And here's another beautiful work of his. Does this look like a landscape to you? When I look at it, I can see a canyon or arroyo in the American Southwest, dry, rocky. Notice how he's using the granularity of the ink, the texture of the paper to help us develop this sense of this dry landscape. But at, on the other hand, you can see it as pure abstraction, in which case it just becomes this glorious example of different densities of ink diffusing away. That's a very modernist technique. A lot of Western modern art, you can see a three-dimensional scene and then it snaps back into a flat abstraction. So that confusion of the brain doing both those things is part of what makes these works fascinating. Next, please. After the Apollo flight in 1968 with that famous photograph, Earthrise, as well as the artist's time spent in the base camps around the Himalayas, he developed this much more um, aerial kind of view, like looking at the earth as a whole. And that seems to be in concert with the developing spirituality of the artist and also statement about ecology and the health of the earth. So we start to see him move into this kind of more formal abstraction later on. Let's go to our next contemporary artist, a slightly younger uh, individual than Li Guo Song, Li Huai Yi. And we can go to the next slide that takes his photo away. Now this, again, this one should be reminiscent for you of Northern Song paintings because we have these incredibly powerful mountains that are somewhat inhospitable, but even more vertiginous than the Fan Quan painting that we saw. At least we saw little donkeys on the ground. Here, we don't really see the ground. It's almost like we're being dropped from an airplane into these incredible mountains. Now, this is a very large painting. 
that, um, well, I'll tell you a bit about him. He grew up, uh, he was born in Shanghai, but he moved to San Francisco in 1982, got a master's in fine art there. So again, very influenced by Western art. The way he starts his paintings is he takes big containers of ink and throws them on the paper. So the shapes of these mountains, they're jagged shapes, that is somewhat accidental. And there, there are Western modernists who do that as well. Then with a very fine brush, he develops these tiny, tiny crevices and delicate trees and that's wonderful yin mist that you see floating around the mountains. So again, we have the Yang Mountains, the Yin Mist, in a very modernist way that reflects the Northern Song. Next, please. A third contemporary artist, Li Chunyi, has also taken as his frequent subject these powerful mountains, but he's using an entirely different technique. What he does is he carves Chinese characters into soft wood chops. And then depending on how dense the ink is, he stamps them in these grids. And because the ink is of different densities, he's able to develop this three-dimensional form of mountains fading into the mist. Really unusual, again, very laborious technique. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see his inspiration. So he is looking back at these ancient steles that are particularly prominent during the Han Dynasty. And you can see these ancient seal script characters that are in a grid. So we have this merging of writing and imagery in this unique way that is so uh, conducive because Chinese is ideograph characters and not an alphabet the link between writing and painting is closer and it's kind of flowing into one another in his work. He also has sometimes some kind of obscure political commentary. So for example, this one's called Mao Zedong Landscape. And I don't know about this particular one, but I do know that in many of his works, he'll take, for example, a speech by Mao and he'll scramble the characters. So instead of being able to read it in columns right to left, it's all scrambled. So it's nonsense. And you can take what you will about what he's trying to say there. Okay, let's go to the next slide. All right, so now we're moving into the Yuan dynasty. So this is when the Mongols swept down from the north. The northern Song had already been conquered by a different set of northern nomads, but then Kublai Khan swept down, conquered them, and conquered the southern Song, which was the last holdout of the original Han Song rulers, and combined it into a unified Mongol dynasty. And of course, it was very harshly ruled at the beginning, especially in Southern China because they put up the biggest fight. And um, let's, let's go to the next slide. The question is, would you participate in that government? So we have to talk about Zhao Mengfu. He's one of those great theoreticians, artists, poets, calligraphers. And even in his day and ever after, the question was, was he a traitor? A lot of people thought he was, or was he a patriot? Especially because he was part of the Sung royal family that had been violently deposed. So when Kublai Khan was starting his government in Dadu, which would later become Beijing, he called for the most talented men to work for him. And Zhao Mingfu did not go to the country and live in obscurity. He answered the call and became part of his government. Zhao wrote a lot about his feelings that we have records of. So one of the things he wrote was, though living in simple poverty, one can find happiness for oneself, would it not be better to help the world? In other words, this difficult decision, do you just say, I'm not gonna have anything to do with this, or do you try to stay to make the government more humane, more fair? He felt that the second option was the harder yet the more noble option. However, it's not that he didn't have a lot of regrets. So in a poem called Wrongly Leaving 
retirement, he wrote, yesterday I was a gull roaming the waters, today I am a bird in a cage. And in that poem, he also wrote, I sometimes amuse myself painting, hoping to preserve my wilderness nature. And that immediately makes us think of the Sung Dynasty literati, of Taoism, of returning to the natural world as an antidote, basically, of having to deal with society. Let's look at one of his paintings now. He was able to paint in many different styles. This is his most famous painting, and we can immediately see how admired and beloved it is by the number of chops and writing all over it, because that's what collectors did when they really liked what they had. Some of these chops are emperors and other esteemed collectors through the centuries. So when you look at the image, you might think, hmm, really, is that, why is this such a great painting? We see spatial recession, and then these two mountains kind of plunk down very obviously on there, and these trees that look a little random and slightly cartoonish. What Zhao is doing, which he explicitly said in his writings, is there's this blend of sophistication and deliberate unschooled primitivism, because that less less schooled style is was associated with high antiquity which was a kind of paradise and this oh and besides that the mountains are painted with mineral pigments like azurite malachite and that was a nod to the tong dynasty remember that was a han dynasty a very very powerful dynasty so even in the materials used he's linking it back to that past dynasty so here we have a guy who's collaborating with the enemy government and yet coded in his painting, he's saying, I too mourn and grieve for the beautiful society we once had. So there's a very sophisticated level of commentary going on in this painting. Also interesting in the very top center, see that nice neat script in the center? He was a renowned calligrapher as well. He is putting his thoughts on this painting. He supposedly was the first artist to put his thoughts in such a prominent place. Usually it would be in the colophon in the left end part. And what he says there is that he painted this for his lifelong friend, Zhou Mi, who was also from the South like he was. And he, Zhou Mi was a Yi Min or leftover subject, which means he was a literatus who refused to participate in the government. But apparently Zhou Mi didn't um, condemn Zhao. So Zhao felt a lot of gratitude towards him. And Zhou Mi couldn't travel, but Zhao, being an important bureaucrat, went all over China. And here he's painting Zhou Mi's ancestral homeland in Shangdong. Zhou had never seen it. Uh, these are two very characteristic mountains in that area. So he's showing him where his ancestors came from because Zhao was able to, to go there. All right, let's have a closer look at the style of this, which is so fascinating. Next slide. So this is what I mean by deliberate lack of sophistication. If you look at that little boat dock at the at the bottom edge, there's no real perspective there and the house above it also not much perspective. The two figures we see are just one step above stick figures. All the branches of the reeds are parallel to the picture plane. You know, there's a bit of a cartoonish look to it. So that was his homage to past styles. Now let's compare this style of painting with the next artist. So immediately we see much greater sophistication in the depiction of this scene. Uh, in the lower right, there's a close up hillock, which is very detailed, you know, gnarly looking. And then as we go back, we see this interesting bank of a river or lake, and we have this very distinct sense of spatial recession. These clumps of bamboo are very anatomically or not anatomically, but I mean, it looks like how they really grow, right? We can feel them splaying out. The leaves are going in all different directions. 
And this was painted by a woman, Guan Dao Sheng. Look at the skill that this woman had. Why would that happen? In Confucian society, it, you were actually ashamed if you had an accomplished woman in your household that anyone outside the family took notice of. That's not what women were supposed to do. They were supposed to be subordinate to all males, including their sons after a certain age. So how did she get to do this? Well, she grew up in a family without sons. Her father recognized her brilliance from a very early age. So she received a boy's classical education. And she also was a renowned poet, calligrapher, and painter. When it came time to marry her off, this prosperous fam family found a good candidate, who was the last artist we just saw. So she was the wife of Zhao Mingfu. And amazingly, because he wrote a lot about their marriage, it seemed to be a marriage of equals, intellectual equals. They would write poetry on each other's paintings. She managed his financial estate. During his extensive travel, she, he took her with him. So she really had an unusual ex life experience. And she was widely collected by royal, the royal ladies of the court and the Emperor Renzong commissioned her to do a big calligraphic work and gave her a title independent of her husband. Well, are we just looking at bamboo here or is there some symbolism? I think you know the answer to that by now. Bamboo is a very traditionally masculine subject because it is strong, it stays green in the winter, winter it bends without breaking. So this was Guan's primary subject. She deliberately picked a masculine subject. And then this of course is just a segment of a long hand scroll. Look at what's behind the primary spray of bamboo that we're seeing here. You see that horizontal cloud? That's the yin mist the female element, and it is rocketing through this hand scroll, and it is so dense that it completely obliterates everything behind it. So there's a commentary there too, as to the strength and power of the feminine, the female element in the yin-yang balance. Next slide. The love story of Zhao Mingfu and Guan Da Sheng is quite famous. You can even go to Chinese internet Weibo and see an animated cartoon of it. And this part of the story is about Zhao is a middle-aged, very prosperous bureaucrat. Most men in his situation would have multiple wives or concubines, and he's kind of considering it. Maybe it's time to get a concubine. And then supposedly Late at night in the garden, he finds a poem from Guan. Let's go to the next slide because I have to read you this poem. It's called Married Love. You and I have so much love that it burns like a fire in which we bake a lump of clay, molded into a figure of you and a figure of me. Then we take both of them, smash them into dust and mix the dust with water and mold again a figure of you and a figure of me. You are in me and I am in you. In life, we share a single quilt. In death, we will share a single crypt. And as the story goes, he did not take a second wife or concubine. And even though he lived three years after her death, he did not remarry. I don't think he could ever find a woman to compare with her. And as he described her, her manner was winning with an intelligence clear as moonlight. Now let's go to a contemporary female Chinese artist who occasionally works with her husband. And that's Lin Tianmiao. And her story is that she was part of a large family and her job was to be seamstress for the family, which she did not particularly like. And in days of, um, you know, where you didn't have much income, they would take apart rags and get the threads and then reuse the threads to make other things. So a lot of her childhood, she remembers of doing that. And she now works in multimedia installations and sculptures that are quite, quite quirky. They have been called feminist, although she does not, um, that label doesn't, she doesn't feel it fits her. 
So you see, she often works with textiles like cotton or silk, as in this sculpture next to her self-portrait here, and strange combinations of anatomy with tools and other things like that. Let's go to the next slide. She occasionally collaborates with her husband, who's a very successful video artist. And what we're seeing here is still shots from a video installation that they did together called Here or There, in which we see these nymph-like female figures that are responding to a variety of environments, such as a Chinese classical garden or a freeway overpass or shattered ruins. And they all have this kind of evocative sense of these kind of startled young women in these sometimes hostile environments. Let's look at a close-up of one of these scenes. So here we see this, actually it's like an army of identical nymph-like figures and it looks like she's supplicating the heavens. And where is she standing? She's standing in this just completely dead, um, kind of maybe formerly agricultural, but the ground is just wasted and unproductive now. And of course, that could be a commentary on ecological disaster uh, or some other commentary on modernism. It reminded me of a quote by Mencius, the Confucian teacher. Let's go to the next slide there, who says, a once luxurious mountain robbed of its trees is like a human heart insufficiently cultivated. So again, we see the, the notion that nature and humanity, that the character of both, is linked. It's not really two different subjects. It's the same subject. We are part of nature and nature is part of us. Next, please. All right, let's go to the last dynasty that we'll talk about. Here we're back under Han rule. And like most Chinese dynasties, it's very, very well run for you know, sometimes several centuries, but eventually things start to fall apart. So let's talk about the most important artist theoretician of the late Ming. Next slide. And that is Dong Qichang. It really, there's so much to say about him, it's, it's hard to cut it down. Anyway, he lived in the late Ming when things were really deteriorating, largely due to probably the worst emperor in the whole history of emperors, Wan Li, who for 25 years did absolutely nothing. He didn't convene his court. He didn't answer any correspondence. He didn't receive any people from the province who were beseeching him. He didn't manage his military. He did nothing. So probably he was just partying with his concubines, but. Not surprisingly, due to complete lack of direction from the top, things were declining. And there was a sense of that kind of gloom of, of uh, once very powerful dynasty starting to fall apart. Also art at this time had become very calcified, just rote copying. So Dong, who was a brilliant, brilliant scholar um, and very informed, of ancient calligraphy and painting and also very engaged in Chan or Zen Buddhism came to what he called the great synthesis, which was that you look back to the past, but you don't just slavishly copy it. You apply it to your current times. He was also the one that came up with the idea of the Northern and Southern schools of painting, which is very confusing. But since you will hear this all the time, if you, you look at traditional Chinese art, basically it's not artists that come from the North or the South. He links it with styles of Buddhism. So Northern Buddhism tended to believe that enlightenment was a very gradual process after many years of dedicated meditation practice. Whereas the Southern school of Buddhism believed that you could have this lightning bolt sudden enlightenment that was permanent. You could just be sweeping your path and all of a sudden zap, you're enlightened. 
Dong associated literati style art with the Southern or Sudden Enlightenment School of Buddhism. So he greatly favored what he called Southern school painters. And as an example of a Northern school painter, the Fan Quan painting that we saw at the beginning, that would be a classic Northern school, very tight, detailed, dense. This is also the Southern school was informed by Zen painting. So, you know, that was very loose, very simple, very minimalist, very obvious brush strokes. That's what he felt was superior and needed at this particular time. So what he said is that brushwork and painting should really be the same as calligraphy. In other words, the subject matter was really of secondary concern. You should be appreciating the artist's or the, um, the calligraphic touch of the brush in the art. And this last sentence I put in, it, he said, it should be a dynamic expressive form achieved by the unifying breath momentum, again, that word chi, of the artist's physical movements. And that struck me because that again is so much like abstract expressionism. When you think of Jackson Pollock's drip paintings, that are bold dance-like movements that reflect his mind and emotions at that particular moment. It's almost like a, a diary of a dance at that moment. It's his physical state, that essence coming out at that moment. So that's roughly, you know, approximates what Dong was talking about. Let's look at one of Dong's late paintings, his last dated painting. Next slide. And I'll show you a close up in a minute. But see how different this is than Fan Quan. There are no dark, dense, solid masses here. It's all about the dancing brush. And he, it's almost deliberately made not to look realistic. We would never confuse this with a scene that we're looking at. He often did ranges of mountains like we see at the top, that strange kind of spine of mountains with almost like rib cage marks on either side and underneath some odd angular marks. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see the close up. See that he's, it's very, a lot of dry brush, you know, not a lot of ink and a lot of patterned marks. So in the left, about the, a third of the way from the left. Look at that vertical coursing down. That's a waterfall. And you can see, you know, we can see it as almost a diagram of a waterfall. We don't, it doesn't look like a real waterfall, but we can see the movement, see the shapes of the brush strokes. You have diamond shapes, triangular shapes, comma shapes. And then at the very bottom, it lands in a pool and you have these circular swirl shapes there. So he's translating the real world into this vocabulary of brush strokes. We also see a lot of the ax cut kun strokes going from left to right. So in the trees and uh, some of the hills, you see where he's laid the brush down on the right side and picked it up in a horizontal movement. So it's pointier on the left side of the stroke. Um, the dotted stippling of the foreground tree with various densities of ink. This is kind of sophisticated vocabulary of brushstrokes that he's wanting to the viewer to enjoy apart from the scene of what it represents. Next, please. And here we come to really the most surprising um, biography of all. Arnold Zhang, he pronounces his name Zhang, was born in New York City, had a typical upbringing as a teenager, fell in love with Chinese calligraphy and studied with an old master from Shanghai. Then he went to UC Berkeley and studied with the probably the greatest Chinese art historian ever, James Cahill. Cahill introduced him to probably the greatest private collector of Chinese art ever, C.C. Wong in New York. And there Zhang was able to copy original paintings owned by C.C. Wong going all the way back to the Northern Song. So remember at the beginning, Zhe He's list of things that you had to do, number six was copying the masters from the past. He actually got to do that. He then founded the Chinese art department at Sotheby's and worked there for almost 20 years before he became a full-time artist. 
you can see his fascination with the traditional landscape here. And um, it's a little hard to see, but you see the little white, the white mist that's coursing between the mountains that when you see it in that linear fashion, it's called Lung Mai or dragon veins. So that again is that yin yang sense of the living land with this almost the blood of the land coursing through in these veins of mist. Next, please. He was one of 10 Chinese artists invited to respond to a work at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. And perhaps not surprisingly, he'd grown up in New York seeing these artists. He chose Jackson Pollock's drip painting number 10. And below that is a really poor quality photograph of one of his response paintings. I'll show you a close up in a minute. Uh, but you see there's very similarity. Uh, the similarity is there's no uh, main focal point. It's an all over design. There's a combination of background strokes and real bold broad strokes, combination of curved and sharp angled lines. So he's really capturing this aesthetic of Jackson Pollock's work, but putting it into a uh, traditional Chinese vernacular. Next slide. Here's a close up of a detail of that painting. And look at how he makes the, the calligraphic brush mark so prominent. He's not trying to convince us that we're looking at a mountain. We can see that he's using the point of the brush and part of it and kind of twiddling it around and getting those intricate curly lines. He's using the side of the brush, getting those kind of blotted strokes. He's using a dry brush where we can see the texture of the paper come through. And he's got these real delicate washes in the background. So just as we saw with the last artist, Dong, Dong Chichung, Dong Chichung, um, we're seeing the, the primacy of the calligraphic mark in his art. Next slide. I know I am rushing us and I'm sorry to go so fast. I just wanna cover three more artists and then we'll move on to Lily's comments. Yang Yongliang is this fantastic artist. When you discover him, go to his website, he will knock your socks off. At first we look at this and it says, well, it looks like a Northern Song inspired landscape. But let's go to the next slide. Not the exact same painting, but very typical of his work. When you look more closely at it, it's a digital photo montage. There's no brush or ink here. And the mountains are entirely made out of photographs of skyscrapers. And what originally looked like trees are oil derricks and cell phone towers and cranes. And the rocks in the river are houses. And if you zero in on the boundaries of the river, there's trash and detritus. So this scene that looks like the natural world at first turns out to be entirely made out of man-made objects. Next slide. And he even has these gigantic installations that are video. So you see helicopters flying in, you hear the traffic noise, you see the headlights coursing on the little roads. And it's this incredible binary experience of this beautiful, beautiful world that you're stepping in stepping into that is at the same time, modern and artificial and kind of disturbing. It's that complex interplay of forces that he's capturing in his art. Next slide. And I just wanna jump back to one more late Ming artist, Dong Chichong knew Wu Bin and really admired his work. But I think we can see similar to the last artist, um, Yang Yong Liang, these distorted kind of science fiction type mountains, very imaginative. So he's taking it into a new level of the imagination. In the close up, we see this building with this curved kind of, I don't know what to call it, hallway that is directly over a waterfall. I don't know if they would have been building like that in the 1500s. It all, it, to me, it looks like it's very much an imaginary scene. At the bottom, there's these vertical stalactites under this natural bridge. Just tremendous, weird imagination in this. Next slide. And as James Cahill, that art historian said about him, the astonishing vision of the mountain as an immense organism 
has taken on its unnatural shape, not so much through erosion or other natural processes, as through some vegetal or fungoid growth unregulated by terrestrial laws. Well, that was a great description. Okay, let's go to, oh, we have one more on Wubin. Next slide, please. What Wubin is most famous for is this hand scroll, 10 views of a Ling B stone. Uh, and this, you know, um, scholars rocks were, were incredibly important. They placed them on their desk or big ones in their gardens. They've represented concentrated chi and were objects of meditation and beauty, especially when they were really weird looking. So I wanna go to our last artist who takes this concept and puts it in the modern language of contemporary art. Next slide, please. Jean Wang, who is a very su internationally successful artist. And one of his big series is this uh, series of scholars rocks. Some are huge, 14 feet tall, and they're made out of industrial material, stainless steel. So you have this same beautiful, odd configuration that you can see through, but now you have the distorted reflections of this modern material of stainless steel. And I'll end with a quote on the next slide by Jean. He grew up in Beijing during a period of very rapid urbanization. And here is him talking about the meaning of his work. The true problem is everything we have is messed up. The stone in a peaceful traditional garden is abandoned in front of a modern skyscraper. The past is gone. There are no longer true literati. In this cunning and opportunistic period of transformation, one needs strategy and wisdom to regain confidence. I position the literati culture in today's society by deconstructing all the visual experiences related to it and I hope to express my attitude towards modernization. So I think some of these modern artists are very poignantly talking about a kind of nostalgia for the beauty of traditional Chinese culture, at the same time confronting both the advantages and the, uh, the destructive potential of contemporary society, which is, to my mind, is a very important thing for art to talk about. Next slide. So I hope we've covered these in this lightning fast presentation and let's go to the next slide. If you are ready to take a screenshot, you can with Lily's um, Chinese characters so you can more easily find out more about these artists. But as I said, they will also be, let's see, Elizabeth, are we putting them in the chat now or putting this document in the chat, I mean? Yeah, so Elizabeth has sent a link to the Google Drive where you'll see this. So you can download it from there by going into chat and clicking on the link. Okay, and the next slide is the second part of that handout. If you just want to. Okay, next slide. Uh, you could also take a screenshot or download the document from chat. Just some general information on art history, especially ink painters, and some books I enjoyed on Chinese history. Okay, since my talk was so long, I want to go directly to Lily's commentary. She had a couple artists she it's going to tell us more about, and then we can both take questions after that. So I'll turn it over to Lily. Thank you. Okay, I just want to uh, thank you very much, uh, and uh, it's always a treat, Elaine, having you speak. And I always love your. Uh, I'm sure I'm speaking for everyone, and um, and uh, we're happy to have a discussion afterwards. So, Lily, are you there? Uh oh. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank. Thank you so much, Elaine. That was wonderful. You did such a quick uh, survey of modern artists that are influenced by the literati um, art. It's just wonderful. I learned a lot. 
Um, I've always loved literati paintings and to study like you did is really wonderful. It brings me to a different level of appreciation for Chinese modern art. And, and thank you, Elaine, to let me know what you were going to cover earlier. So I was going to, uh, I was able to look into some more to have my own tiny study. And I would like to share my enthusiasm with these uh, um, art. So, so I took two artists that Elaine covered and I want, to, I want to share a few more of their paintings so you get to see a more a varieties of each artist uh, as examples. Next. So the first one is this uh, uh, Northern Song an art inspired uh, uh, painting. You saw one a little much bigger than this by uh, Li Hua Yi. The one you saw at Elaine show was much bigger, vast, mountainous scenes. And this one is sort of like a focus cropped into a small scene, but you can still see this, uh, the ink splash to this uh, uh, mountains that are just vertical and very closely spaced with this very detailed photorealistic detail of uh, the, the pine tree. The pine tree is growing sideways, it's almost, uh, unrealistic. So when I used to see Chinese paintings with this type of tree coming out of a rock, I thought it was just made up scene. But after I went hiking in uh, the Yellow Mountain, uh, Huangshan in uh, Anhui province, I realized this is actually uh, very realistic. In Huangshan, you have uh, sheer vertical cliffs with closely spaced uh, mountain peaks. And then these pine trees growing out of uh, just cracks or rocks. It's really amazing. And, and that's how they look like. So it made me really appreciate these um, paintings that even though artists visited the place and then painted at home, but but they really represent what, what it is. So Huangshan is actually a very popular place for artists and um, pay, um, writers to visit, to inspire them. And nowadays it's still a popular place and photographers like it too, because it just gives you these um, unbelievable uh, uh, sceneries. And <laughs> you may think this looks like a Northern Song painting and it really looks like it with the, the gold paper with this uh, vast landscape with very quiet uh, feeling about the scene. So it, it has the spirit of a Northern song, but it's actually very modern with the great detail for the trees. And it's this um, artist, uh, uh, Li Hua Yi. I have more about his uh, paintings next. And here is a huge uh, screen. It's a two-fold gild, gilded screen. It's about six foot tall, <clears throat> but still you see the detail he was able to print, uh, to paint. You see this, uh, the tree with very detailed uh, texture of the bark, uh, leaning out from the mountain. And then toward the end, you see these um, feathery, very fine leaves and branches. So he's mixing something very strong very powerful with something very soft. It's like the uh, opposite yin and yang combination. And, and when you look at it, it has the Chinese painting of uh, the ink painting on this uh, gold paper. Um, but you really feel this, uh, the diagonal composition that this thing is protruding into the space somewhere. So, so there's definitely the uh, Western influence a combination of uh, the East and the West and the combining the, the ancient with modern. And next. And here is a typical Zodiac painting. He actually did 12 of them and they look just very ancient. You see this mouse looking up as if he's trying to find out how he can get this food. And he's on this rock. So the composition is, is very interesting. You see the almost like a dialogue between the uh, a dialect between the mouse and the food. Next. So I'm showing a few more just as an example. Um, I just think all the compositions are 
pretty modern. And there's a, uh, if you look at the ox, there's movement. Uh, the ox is uh, playing with the small, uh, my, maybe the baby. And, and, and if you look at the, um, the dragon, it's kind of typical flying in the air. Uh, and the snake is in the middle of striking out. So there is movement in, in all his combination. Um, that's pretty modern. Next. Here's a, the end of the 12 zodiacs. And again, all the colors are pretty much just ink with a gold paper. So they look old, except for this white rooster. It's popping out of the picture. And every animal has a space in front. So you feel like there's room for them to, to go. Uh, but the the goat, the one on the top right, uh, top left, the goat, he's at the edge of a cliff and he's definitely very safe. So it, it's interesting that the artist would make comp uh, composition that makes us feel comfortable. And, and that's probably more of a uh, traditional way of feeling things are calm and comfortable. It's very different from the ones uh, Elaine talked about these uh, uh, disturbing artificial objects that are um, kind of problem in our society and, and some of the uh, modern paintings are really uh, discussing the, the social issues. And, and that's a big topic for today's uh, modern art. But I think uh, Li Hua Yi is uh, staying in this calm, quiet uh, feeling. And I think that's still highly appreciated. And now I want to talk more about colors for our next artist next. Here's another artist uh, Elaine talked about. Um, it's a Zhao Shao, Zhao Shao Ang. And notice the color. You 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 really feel the Western influence. Zhao Shao Ang uh, was a native uh, Guangdong province. Uh, Guangdong is really very southern part of uh, China. When Elaine talked about Dong Qichang representing the Southern art style. That was still in the Yangtze River. So when you get to Guangdong, that's really the uh, almost the limit of the Southern part of China. So he, uh, he is considered the second generation of the Lingnan School. Lingnan School represents um, uh, Guangdong province and they're influenced by literati as well as Western art. Their style is almost more revolutionary uh, with powerful colors. And here, if you look at the bamboo leaves, it has the Chinese uh, traditional literati style, very powerful uh, brushwork and stop occasionally. And uh, the different shades of gray gives you the layering and, and depth for the painting. Um, and also in the water, you see some marks of the waves that gives you a depth perception. That is a little of a Western uh, concept about uh, perspective. And then when you look at the, the fish, the goldfish, the title of the painting, the goldfish, the eyeballs and the outline are pretty clear and sharp. But when you get to the surface of the fish, it's, it's really blurred and that's, um, on purpose. He wanted you to look at it with your own interpretation because our eye would uh, make the image as we are familiar with something. So he didn't have to depict everything and, and just let you uh, make up the image. And that's his style. It, it, that's pretty modern as well. So um, it, it's a colorful and um, pretty striking um, image of this painting. Next, as I said, he represents a second generation of a Lingnan school and they use very powerful colors. Here is a uh, light over the pond and the moonlight is pretty big here. And notice the, the broken and fading lotus leaves. It must be fall. In the fall, the moon seems bigger and brighter so this is under moonlight. And if you look at the branches and the leaves, this uh, bright white moonlight reflection, it makes this painting really uh, masterful. Someone with uh, 
great skill will be able to do this. Most of the people won't be able to do this, especially knowing watercolor or Chinese painting. It's hard to paint white. You, you really have to um, leave it um, at the beginning. On the lower left, you see some uh, birds and they are just symbolically uh, marked. There's no detail. But what we feel is this, uh, the gigantic lotus leaves uh, with all the light reflection. It, it, it's just a gorgeous painting. If I were in a gallery to see this, I would definitely walk closer and, and take a closer look. Um, so as I said, he was the leader of the second generation uh, Lingnan school from Guangdong. The next painting I want to show you is the third generation, the leader of the third generation um, Lingnan school. Next. This is a, a painting from our own collection. And you notice this orchid leaves are just as uh, painted like a bamboo leaves very fast. So this is uh, the Chinese calligraphy or literati style. And this is painted by Oh Hao Nian. So he's um, a generation younger than um, Zhao Shao Ang. And um, with a little bit of a symbolic uh, suggestion, we see the butterflies and the flowers for the orchids with just a few fine lines for the uh, butterfly antennas. I don't know if you can see, and then the columns of the uh, flowers. So I guess I, I'm trying to uh, look a little differently from different styles. All these modern artists are going in different directions as uh, Elaine discussed. It, it's a uh, modern art is just unlimited. You can go in any direction. And if you have basic uh, skills, these uh, Chinese artists all started with uh, calligraphy and eventually they, they went in all different directions. So it's really interesting to study uh, these artists that were influenced by the literati style. So I don't want to take any more time. So uh, I'm going back to questions. So if you guys have uh, questions, I guess uh, we can all discuss and, and Bob would, um, would moderate and we can discuss back and forth. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Lily, and thank you, Elaine. I, I think, again, I'm speaking for everybody and saying that this has been a delight uh, today, a morning, afternoon, where whatever time zone you find yourself in, and uh, this was a complete treat. And uh, I've heard other talks by both of you folks, and so I'm not surprised at the extreme quality uh, and how wonderful it all is. Uh, and by, I want to emphasize that this will be uh, recorded and will be able to be seen on the San Diego um, Chinese Historical Museum website. So you'll be able to see it. So uh, I do want to ask uh, <clears throat> Elizabeth about questions from the audience. Elizabeth? As of right now, most of what I have are comments, I guess. So a lot are in praise of Elaine's presentation. So for example, Kathy Jones, how I love to listen to you, Elaine. I always <laughs> learned so much. And once again, you killed it. We are so appreciative anytime you are here with us. I am looking for raised hands. I see Hilda is here from Holland. So how cool is that? Uh, yeah. Hi, Hilda. Yeah. Hello, everyone. <laughs> nice to see all of you. Oh, it's a pleasure seeing you. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, I do see a question now in chat. How does Ai Weiwei fit into this category? That is a great question. Um, I... I was focusing on landscape painting or landscape as a motif or literati like the scholar's rock. Ai Weiwei does a lot of installational art using antique furniture and Han Dynasty vases and amazing transformational work. Um, I didn't, 
I didn't do a lot of research on him. So he may have worked with landscape or other specifically literati associated subjects, but I'm not aware of that. So that's why I left him out. The other super important artist that really you'd say, why did you leave him out? Is Jean Gatian. Jean Gatian was a modernist who worked in brush painting, um, very much inspired by the literati and was transformative. For example, Arnold Jean that I mentioned, who grew up in New York, it was when he saw Jean Gatian's paintings that he suddenly turned back towards his heritage and said, I need to know more about that. So that was a big omission as well, but I put it on the handout. So please, please look him up and, and learn more about him as well. I, I guess I'll add a little bit about Zhang Daqian. Zhang Daqian was born in, uh, of course, China, 1899, but he spent a lot of time in South America and then um, California, and then eventually in Taipei. So he was all over the place. He's very influential, but I feel like maybe he didn't belong to any group. He just, he was just an individual, very creative. Mm -hmm. um, Elizabeth, do we have other stuff? I, I have to point out that one of our little aphorisms in the docent world at the Diego Museum of Art is that we turned, uh, I know what I like, uh, on its head, we say, "I uh, I like what I know," and uh, the more you uh, the more you study something, the more you enjoy it. And uh, every time I read and see Chinese uh, art, I enjoy it more. And I love the uh, the collaboration between calligraphy, poetry, and the art itself. And uh, I and I'm sure you folks do too, uh, Elizabeth. What else do we have there? You have a question from Alan. Um, he's interested to know if there are any artists from the Chinese diaspora. Yeah, many of these artists have spent time outside of China, even if they were born in China. For example, the female artist Lin Tianmiao, she and her husband lived in New York in the 1980s and were very influenced. She went to art school there with the art scene in New York City, but then they moved back to Beijing. Arnold Zhang, of course, was born in New York. Li Chunyi, the artist that does the stamping, he was born in Taiwan. Um, so I'm sure we could find, you know, the whole Hong Kong art scene, I don't have, I don't think I have any Hong Kong artists here. That would be a whole talk in and of itself. So there were kind of the periphery of China where there might have been more freedom of expression, that there are really vibrant art movements. Yeah, I want to add a little bit about Hong Kong. The Hong Kong artists mainly are part of this uh, Lingnan school, the Canton um, of Guangdong province influence. And in our museum, there are some artists from Hong Kong representing the Lingnan school. Elizabeth, uh, do, we have, uh, do we have anything else? Right now, I don't see any new questions. I'm looking for raised hands as well. Well, uh, we're going to wait another minute or so, and then we're going to uh, remind all the listeners that, number one, this is going to be available on the website. Number two, uh, our... Uh, our talks are going to be throughout 2024, largely on the third Saturday, except for next month when it's going to be on uh, Sunday the 11th. And uh, we're totally looking forward to hearing about that ancient 2300-year-old poem, uh, Li Sao. And uh, that's going to be uh, a lot of fun. Uh, and... Uh, uh, and if you could, I, I don't know if you can throw that slide up uh, about the uh, coming events. And then while we're at it, I'll give a shout out to uh, Lockwood Young from Honolulu, who's uh, a uh, medical school uh, graduate uh, a year off from me. Uh, and uh, we're happy to welcome him. So we're having people from uh, uh, many uh, states and many time zones.
Uh, so here we are. Uh, so we're going to have uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. San Pauli next month on Sunday, the 11th, and then March 16th, our traditional third Saturday, we'll have the Dragon Boat Festival by Lily Birmingham herself and the symbolism in Lee Sal. And so uh, very, very cool. And uh, if there are any further uh, comments, we're happy to hear them. Otherwise, I want to thank uh, both Lily and Elaine. And uh, Elaine, I think I can speak for everyone in saying I hope uh, we have you back uh, for uh, another brilliant talk. And uh, it's so nice seeing you again. And otherwise, we want to wish everybody uh, the best for the weekend. And we're going to ask the uh, the uh, principals uh, uh, today to stay on for just a few minutes 